Good afternoon, children. Today we will be studying the seed and the fruit. The fruit is formed from the ovary after fertilization, and the seed is formed from the ovule after fertilization. Seeds can be of two broad categories depending on the number of cotyledons dicotyledonous seeds and monocotyledonous seeds. Dicotyledonous seeds have got two cotyledons, and monocotyledonous seeds have got one cotyledon. Seeds can again be divided into two more categories depending on the presence or absence of endosperm. Normally, as the embryo grows, it uses up most of the endospermic tissue. But the endosperm remains in some plants and then those seeds are known as endospermic seeds. In some, like in beet and black pepper, the remnant of the nucellus remains around the embryo and that's called perisperm. Now let's draw a dicot seed and understand the parts. Dicot seeds can be both albuminous and exalbuminous. Albuminous means endospermic. Exalbuminous means non-endospermic. Let's take a dicotylidinous albuminous exalbuminous seed first. B seed, B seed. So B seed has got, uh, we call the kidney having bean shaped and a bean being kidney shaped. So it's a ready form. It's got a concave margin and a convex margin. On the concave margin, we find the hilum and the micropyle. Micropyle is the same micropyle through which the pollen tube had entered into the embryo sac. And hilum is marks the point of attachment of the ovule with the wall of the ovary. So the funicle was attached to the ovule and that mark remains as the hilum. Uh, it has got the integuments that were present in the ovule, they remain as integuments here, but they are now called tester and tegmen. Tester is darker in color and thicker, tegmen is lighter in color and thinner. After removing the tester and the tegmen, the seed will look somewhat like this. So you have a radical protubing out and this is the tester and the tegmen. These two are the cotyledons. Radical is a portion of the embryonal axis. Now let's open the two cotyledons and see what it looks like, what the seed looks like. You will find that the embryonal axis is attached to the cotyledons at one point. The portion above is known as the epicotyl with the plumule, and the portion below is known as the hypocotyl with the radical. The cotyledons are elongated, white in color, thick and fleshy, and they store the reserved food material. There is no endosperm here. The primule will give rise to the shoot system on germination, and the radical will give rise to the root system on germination. So this is a dicotyledonous, exalbuminous or non-endospermic seed. Let's consider a dicot seed which is albuminous. The example is castor. In castor, the seed is roughly oval in shape. It's got a protuberance on one side, which is known as caruncle. The caruncle masks the hilum and the microbiome. The tester is variegated. It's got silver markings on a brown background. And it is hard. On it has to be shelled off. On removing the tester, we will find the old seed somewhat like this. The caruncle also comes out. And this is silvery white in color. So the tegment is silvery white in color. Now when we cut the seed in this fashion, you will find it looks like this. There is a flat, thin, flat cotyledon. Right? This is the test tegmen. This portion is the endosperm. This is the cotyledon, and this is the embryonal axis. The cotyledon may seem to be big, but it is flat. The surface is flat and raw. Let's see the side view to understand what that the cotyledons are not 
very they're not very thick. So you find here this is the tegmen, this is the endosperm, these two are your cotyledons, this is the embryonal axis. What is this? This is the embryonal axis. So see the two cotyledons from the side, they look very thin. So it will be somewhat like this. Supposing this is your embryonal axis, my two hands are your cotyledons. So it will be placed like this. The two cotyledons are thin and papery, right? And if I see it this way, the two cotyledons are broad. But this way we'll see it's thin. The two cotyledons can be removed. So this is a dicot seed and it is albuminous. This was a dicot seed, it was exalbuminous. Monocot seeds are normally all albuminous. Let's take the case of a maize seed. So maize seed you'll find in one side surface there's a depression. This marks the position of the embryo. If you cut this and then you see the side view, it will look like this. This is the endosperm and this is the embryo. This is separated by a thin layer of cell known as the epithelium. Of the endosperm, the outer region of the endosperm is rich in protein and yellow in color and is called the aneuron layer. The inner part is white and rich in starch. The embryo is made up of a single cotyledon and the embryonal axis. Let's take it out and see what it looks like. This is the single cotyledon and the embryonal axis. The single cotyledon is called sputellum and the embryonal axis is attached to the cotyledon at one point. The portion above is called epicotyl with premium. The portion below is called hypocotyl with the radical. The epicotyl is covered by a roll of leaves known as coleoptile. And the hypocotyl and radical is covered by a roll of leaves known as coleorhizum. The epicotyl will pierce through the coleoptile and sprout up into the shoot system. And the hypocotyl will pierce through the coleorhizum and form the root system. So this is the part of your seed, the seed. Now the seed, in seeds you have two terms, dormancy and quiescent. Both means inactive, but the difference is, dormancy is for an internal cause and quiescent is external. In both we'll have low metabolic rate, slow metabolic rate reactions, right? But quiescent is, the term quiescent is used when the conditions are not favorable. If you give the favorable conditions, then it will become, it will become, it will be able to grow. And in spite of giving the favorable conditions, if it does not grow, then we'll call it dormancy. So favorable conditions are warmth, oxygen, that's temperature, oxygen, water. These are the conditions that are necessary for germination. So if the conditions are given and it grows, that's called quiescent. And in, the, in spite of providing the conditions, if it does not grow, then that's dormancy. There are internal factors for it. And when a seed sprouts up into a seedling and wakes up from its dormancy, process is called germination. So this was a part of the seed. Now let's come to fruit. Fruit is a ripened ovary. The ovary becomes the fruit. Fruit can be first divided into two broad categories, true fruit and false fruit. When is it true fruit? If it develops directly from the ovary, we'll call it true fruit. When is it false fruit? When any other part of the plant flower becomes a fruit, then we'll call it false fruit. Apple is a false fruit. The part of the apple that you eat is not the ovary. You're eating the thalamus. So the thalamus develops into the fruit. And the part which we throw away after eating an apple from the side, that's the ovary. So the ovary is not developing into the fruit. So that's a false fruit. And true fruit develops from an ovary. Is it clear? Right. Fruits can be categorized into many in many ways. First, we can make, consider them to be simple, aggregate, and composite. When is it simple? 
when it grows from one flower made up of one carpel so naturally one ovary or several carpels fused together to form one ovary this is known as a simple fruit when is it aggregate is growing from one flower but made up of several carpels free carpels so several free carpels means there will be several ovaries and when is it composite when it grows from not from one flower many flowers that means it's growing from an inflorescence and that's called your composite fruit the simple fruit can again be divided into two dry and fleshy when is it dry when the wall of the ovary is dry fruit is dry and it's called a dry fruit and when the wall of the fruit is fleshy that's called a fleshy fruit the dry fruit can again be divided into two it's called dehiscent and indehiscent when is it dehiscent when the wall of the fruit bursts to release the seeds that's called dehiscent and when it does not burst that's called indehiscent to name a few categories of fruit under indehiscent it's akin caryopsis nut samara they don't burst they don't dehisce and the ones which dehisce or burst the legume or pod siliqua silicula the capsule okay? so these are the other ways that it can and uh, follicle so they can burst let like, just think of your pea you have the fruit two margins it will burst along both the margins and the two parts then twine up and the seeds are scattered so this is called bursting of fruits now the wall of the ovary becomes the wall of the fruit the wall of the fruit is divided into three parts together it's called pericarp but is divided into three outer one epicarp middle one mesocarp inner one endocarp think of a typical fruit mango and see the leathery part which you just remove that's your epicarp the fleshy part that you consume that is your mesocarp and the endocarp covers the seed so mango is a typical fruit and you can see all the three walls here epicarp mesocarp and endocarp so this is known as what a typical fruit and we've understood some terms about fruits now sometimes fruits develop without fertilization and this phenomenon is called parthenocarpy so it's the formation of fruit without fertilization is called parthenocarpy and parthenocarpy fruits are naturally seedless because it's formed without fertilization so they are the seedless varieties of banana and grapes that can be formed this is formed under hormonal influence you know horticulturists and all they will be using applying different quantities of hormones to make the flowers change into fruits without fertilization this is about your fertilizer now let's see how long do the seeds survive or remain alive okay and in fact what is the importance of seeds it is continuing one generation from one to the other if seeds were not there then what would happen we wouldn't be having any um, thing to grow for the next uh, season okay and the seeds immediately if they underwent they started growing the same thing it would be the same problem so you would not be able to store it and uh, get our grains so the seeds you know they undergo a period of this dormancy and they can be kept some will remain alive for a few day months some for years and some can even go for hundreds and thousands of years right for here we have two examples one is the lupin okay it was found in the arctic tundra and it uh, uh, started germinating after an estimated year uh, time of about 10000 years right another example is your phoenix dactylifera it was ex- it's a date seed date palm and it started bloomed uh, it germinated after 2000 years okay so this was taken in from the king herald's palace near the dead sea and it uh, germinated after 2000 years so the time varies from seeds to uh, seeds and plants to plants we come into two more terms one is apomixis and another is polyembryo what is apomixis parthenocarpy was fruit formation without fertilization apomixis is seed formation without fertilization 
So, in some cases, you may find that the diploid X cell does not undergo division, reduction division, and it develops into the embryo. This is called apple. So, what will it have retained? It will be having the same characteristics of the parent plant. So, this is apomixis. Right? And the advantage of apomixis is that when we create hybrid plants, and when if you sow the seeds, the characters will segregate. But if by any means we can make apomix from hybrid plants, then we'll be getting the same hybrid qualities. This is apomixis. And polyembryo is, you know that the embryo sac is there. And what is the tissue that surrounds the embryo sac? New cells. The new cell cells, which is naturally deployed, they move into the embryo sac. They're moving into the embryo sac. And they are forming a number of embryos inside the embryo sac. Normally inside the embryo sac we will get one embryo, two egg. But if the new cell cells protrude into the embryo sac, they will form a number of two end structure embryos inside and this is called polyembryo. It's a very common example is in your orange. If you take the orange seed and squeeze them between your fingers, you will find small small green parts. Fragments of green parts. They are your polyembryos. Many embryos inside the seed. And this is a result of what? The protrusion or intrusion of what? The new cellar cells into the embryo sac. So, this is what for today. You studied the seed, fruit, apomixis, parthenocopy, polyembryo. The, go through it, go through the assignment. And complete it in the weekend and submit your work for the senior secondary science section.